All right. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Brain Trust Brunch and Brain. Um, while we give everyone a minute to join, um, let's spark our chat with a question, which is also the question of the week in our professional network. And it is, how are you using AI to optimize your life or work? Great. Right. That was cool. Nice. So I'm seeing a lot of work, some uh, personal as well. Super, yeah, great ideas all together. Great answers. Um, well, thank you all for joining us today. Um, our Brain Trust Brunch and Brain events are designed to gather and learn together. And in today's event, we will navigate artificial intelligence, um, a highly popular topic. Uh, this event is being recorded and you will be able to find it in our um, YouTube channel by the end of this week. So in today's Brunch and Brain, we will start with a brief introduction to artificial intelligence with Freelance Labs co-founder and CEO, Adam Jackson. We will then have two Brain Trust core team members join us and showcase AI auto automations that they are implementing in their work today. And to finalize, Gabe Luna Soseski, co-founder and CRO, will jo join us to announce the winners um, at our first Brain Trust AI competition and showcase the winning concepts and how they can be applied. And due to our packed agenda, Today, I want to note that there will not be a dedicated Q&A at this time, but you are warmly wel welcome to um, continue the conversa conversation over to our career help feed um, for questions in our professional network. And uh, without further ado, join me in welcoming Adam Jackson, Freelance Labs co-founder and CEO. Over to you, Adam. Hey, everybody. Great to see everybody. Appreciate everyone uh, tuning in today. And uh, more importantly, the thanks to everyone who submitted uh, an idea for this contest. We had a lot of really cool ideas, both from core team members here and community members as well. I think we had 35 or something submissions. Uh, big thanks to Gabe for going through all of them. I, I went through most of them to I feel like I could have used an AI to help me go through them. But uh, anyway, so, um, you know, AI is, is actually a very old field of computer science. Um, but it is just now experiencing, you know, kind of its latest renaissance where um, this new technology called large language models combined with lots and lots and lots of training data. And finally, you know, a cheaper compute uh, GPUs and that sort of thing have, have sort of mixed together to create this, you know, AI kind of revolution we're living through right now. And the interesting thing is, you know, we're, we're very high in the hype cycle, but, you know, expectations of, of AI's capabilities probably exceed its actual capabilities right now. However, the capabilities will catch up. And, um, you know, you probably have heard of uh, OpenAI's ChatGPT and Google's BARD, um, you know, very similar kind of large language models trained on all of the data on the internet, right? So it's, you know, it it, it knows a lot of things and can speak eloquently about them, and, and it is often wrong. And we actually saw some of that in our submissions. Uh, one of them was about uh, people in our network who have podcasts, and it was saying all of our investors who have podcasts, and I was like, 
what? I didn't know Logan Allen had a podcast and you go look it up and nope, he has never done a podcast. So, um, so the point, the point here is like, we're, this new technology has the ability to make all of our jobs as knowledge workers more efficient. Um, a lot of what, how we'll be doing that is through building our own LLMs and Emma, Emma's going to talk about that in a, in a minute, but, um, when using the commercial LLMs, like you still have to check your work, right? You still have to kind of be skeptical about what it's saying. And, and like the, 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 the point of this exercise was to like figure out good applicable use cases to make all of our jobs more efficient, maybe even our personal lives more efficient. And then like understand the red flags were like, you know, these things maybe shouldn't be trusted yet. So that that's sort of the brief overview. You know, we're, the way we look at AI here in the network is one, the talent on our network should really be up to speed with, you know, coding co-pilots and design tools and things that make them more efficient for the clients on brain trust. And then two, as, you know, core team members, we need to do more with less. We need to be better and and get more done in our own jobs, you know, with with the help of these external tools as well as the internal ones. So, with that, let me let me kick it over to Frank to talk about some of the uh, applications here at Brain Trust. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, my name is Frank Loeffler, and I'm part of the product growth team here at Brain Trust, responsible for developing initiatives that help uh, both our client and our talent base grow. Um, I'm currently focused on the organic web channel, which includes developing SEO pages that attract companies looking to hire talent. Building pages for the organic web channel typically involves two main components where AI tools can be really useful. Those are topic sizing, figuring out what to target in terms of content, and then two is content development, particularly copywriting. And over the last couple months, we've been experimenting using generative AI to help with these activities. And we found that we could significantly reduce the amount of time needed for each by at least 50% or more. And frankly, that's just our first pass at doing this. As we experiment and learn more, we're likely to find even more savings. Let's go to the next slide. Um, so let's dig into topic sizing first. So what is topic sizing? Really, it's doing three things. One is understanding your target audience really deeply, understanding their needs and your competitors. And then two is building out a list of search terms based on the user intent. That is, what are they trying to do when they're searching? And then three is categorizing oftentimes thousands of keywords to create buckets and then prioritizing them. So here's how we used um, AI for topic sizing. So we use chat GPT-4 or GPT-4, the chat GPT version. Um, that's the paid version. And we fed it a list of um, a thousand plus key target keywords. And we're, the goal here is to try to get to categorize all these keywords so that we can analyze them. So we gave it a prompt that contains three main sections. The first section is the intro that provides an overview of what we're trying to do. In this case, classify the keywords. The next section provides specific information on each classification element. So for example, the user intent, uh, the topic, the location. And then finally, the last section, which is really important, primed ChatGPT to expect more keywords and subsequent prompts as the default amount of tokens or basically words that you can input and output is fairly limited. And this is actually a fairly complex prompt, um, and it took a number of iterations to get it right. Um, and it, interestingly, it can also change from run to run. So you really need to experiment with the prompt language to get it as stable as possible. Next slide. Um, and here you can see the sample output, where it's classified the keywords. Um, as requested, um, it was put into a table, and that way we can export it into Google Sheets and do more analysis on it. Um, and we can slice it by intent and skill, et cetera. And so now with you know, AI being built into a lot of these spreadsheets as well, it becomes even more useful. So on the next slide, um, you can see a quick video um, of the, the whole thing in action. So we're asking ChatGPT again to put it in tables. It's super powerful. Um, if you haven't tried that yet, I highly recommend it. It allows you to export the results in the spreadsheets, right, where you can take further action. Um, and it's just a really great way of organizing data. Um, and it's kind of cool to see it, you know, taking all the information and then, you know, plowing into a, a table like this. So um, very, very cool. Um, all right. And next slide when we're done is, um, so then moving on to content development. So that was the, the topic sizing. So now we've got like all these topics and we classified it and we said, okay, what's the intent? Is this the intent to hire? Um, you know, is this a location-based search? Um, super useful in, in getting all that. And the next step is now like let's start thinking about like how we develop all the content. And there's really three main steps there. One is figuring out what I call the content product. That is what we're trying to build for the target audience. 
um, which includes the page design, the layout, and the content needs. So it's really a product that's trying to fulfill a particular need for a search term. And then figuring out like, how do we sort of produce that content from end to end and the whole page from end to end? And then finally leveraging AI to help write the outline and the first drafts of the content. The next slide. So here's an example of how we built out the content. Um, in this case, you know, this is like eight things to look for when hiring a Laravel de developer. Um, first, we start off with the high level prompt and we ask ChatGPT to provide a summary outline. And then we ask it to expand on each of the items in chunks of four to stay within the token processing limits and kind of the context window as well. Um, and then that allows us to sort of then get like, you know, lots of chunks that we can then put together to create like a, a good first working draft. And then from that point, we actually take that working draft and then we run it through um, editorial and making sure that, you know, it's, it's factually correct, as Adam was saying, sometimes, you know, uh, these things can hallucinate if you're not careful with your prompt. Um, and so we just want to make sure it's factually correct. And then we also want to make sure that editorially, it's in our voice and our tone, et cetera. Um, and then it goes through, a, a, you know, like the last draft. But doing this up front has saved us a ton of time because it actually does a great job of sort of pulling together some of these key things, particularly things for, that are well known in this case that, that you know, like the, the cutoff time for chat GPT-4 is like 2021, September 2021. So if it's, you know, this information's out there and, and is, you know, has a good corpus of content, then it does a really good job there. So next slide. So finally, after we put everything together, um, it makes it, it makes its way to our website and uh, mm -hmm. where it's incorporated into our page about hiring Laravel developers. And as I mentioned from the start, this has been a tremendous time and cost saver for us. The key takeaway, uh, I would say, is that you have to be really careful and precise with your prompts. Always experiment, examine, review the outputs, like I was saying, and know that they can change over time. And I think this is going to be especially true as new um you know, versions are released. They're actually like OpenAI is actually doing some filtering uh, all the time, you know, to kind of get rid of, you know, bad actors and bad responses. But as major new releases come out, like maybe like, you know, GPT 4.1, I would re-examine all of your prompts, especially if you're using it in a production environment, just to make sure everything's working as expected. And that's how we use it over content. And now I'll pass it over to uh, Emma Tang. Thanks, Frank. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Emma Tao. I'm a data scientist here at Burn Trust. And today I'd like to talk about one of the AI models that we have uh, developed here. It's called topic understanding. Um, so a little bit context first. Um, what is the business problem that we're trying to solve and why we chose an AI model for this solution? Uh, as you, most of you are already aware, we recently launched Professional Network. It's this uh, career help tab on the left side of the website. Uh, we, where you can go in there and create posts and ask her related questions. And then you can get the help from the community. Um, so if you haven't got a chance to check it out, I highly recommend you to uh, definitely leverage this new feature to help you grow more professionally. Um, but as we are uh, inviting and welcoming more talents into this new uh, feature, manually review each post and try to understand the particular help that is being asked by each talent becomes quite challenging. Um, so that's why we like to develop an AI model um, that can automatically recognize like recurring themes and also assign key topics to each post. Um, and this will allow us to kind of extract meaningful uh, insights from these posts and make the content more discoverable and retrievable. Um, so by automating this process, we can even further like leverage these insights along with other signals to improve various like functionalities of our platform, such as like free ranking or like personalized recommendations. Um, so the way that we approach this uh, problem was to leverage a pre-trained large language model called BERT um, and some clustering techniques to identify the key topics for each professional network post. Um, so let's look at some details next. Uh, just a quick heads up, there will be some technical jargon mentioned here, um, but hopefully by the end of this presentation, you will feel like uh, you're gaining some valuable insights about AI models in general, and also hopefully being inspired to um, try it on your own. So um, yeah, so generally speaking, there are three major steps in a model development process, um, model training, model uh, evaluation, and model deployment. And this slide here outlines the key steps that we are using for training this topic understanding model. Uh, and this is how we teach our model to learn. Um, the first step is data collection. 
Um, because this model was developed before the public launch of professional network, uh, we made the decision to enhance its accuracy by leveraging a lot of Reddit posts. Um, so we gather about 68,000 public posts and comments from about 60 subreddits. And these are the subreddits that are highly relevant uh, to career help. And we are, we are uh, using this data as our training data. And the next step is something called embedding. For those who are now familiar with uh, natural language processing, this is actually a key step in this process. What it essentially does is to convert a blob of text into a vector of numbers. Um, and in this way, from there, the rest will just be some like math manipulations. You can do all kinds of like, distance calculation from there. Um, here is an example, like uh, someone's asking how to become a PM, and then we convert it into a bunch of numbers which is showing on the right side. Um, and that process is called embedding. Um, so the particular uh, transformer that we're using here is called BERT. Uh, it's an open source language model that was introduced by Google back in 2018 and has grown quite popular since then. Um, once we obtain the new numeric representation of uh, our training data, we can um, look at the distance between all these posts in the vector space. So in the bottom right of this uh, slide, you can see there's like some color coded uh, data dots um, visualization. So those are the 2D projection of our, of our training data. And we kind of color code it based on the distance of these data dots. So let's say if two data dots are very close to each other, we can say, yes, they're neighbors. They kind of have less similar meanings. So we can cluster them together as a group. Um, so this will enable us to cluster like similar posts based on their proximity in the vector space. Once we have these clusters, uh, we will move on to the next step, which is called topic creation and reduction. Uh, because we have these clusters, we can look at keywords from these groups and also apply, um, kind of apply two layers of the topics. The first one is a row topic. And these are um, something about, is it about engineering? Is it about PM? Is it about sales? Um, so those kind of like a role topic. And the next part is a uh, content topic. This is like about like, well, is this post about like job searching? Is it about like resume review, et cetera? So basically we create two layers of the topics. So that's how we teach our model. Let's look at some examples next. Um, so here we have two professional network posts. On the left side, Conrad asking, hey, what kind of backend language should I start exploring? Um, so our model was able to predict the role topic as engineering and the content topic as professional development because you are picking up more skills. On the right side, uh, Mihail is asking, hey, uh, what can any ideas on like personal project recommendations? And our model was able to predict the content topic as, as entrepreneurship. But because there was not a particular role was mentioned in this post. Um, that's why the model didn't assign particular topic, a uh, role topic to this post, which is exactly what we wanted for this model. Um, so those are just two examples to show us how the model works, but how do we evaluate model performance for predictions for all professional network posts? And this is how we do it. This is, um, so basically we ask the model to kind of predict the role type topic and content topic for all professional network posts. And then we invited some of our core team members to uh, come in and manually grade the results. So basically we are looping the human feedback into this process. Um, so for each predict predicted topic, uh, our team members were provided like a yes or no, thumbs up, thumbs down kind of a grading. And then we did the majority vote for the uh, for final results. Um, uh, the outcome was that our model achieved about 84% agreement with a uh, role topic and 75% agreement for content topic. As far as efficiency, it only takes about a um, team member like 30 minutes to grade about 100 posts. But in this case, our model was able to predict topics for these 100 posts in less than one minute. So we are definitely speed up the efficiency without losing um, too much accuracy. So what can we use? Um, how can we use the results from this model? There are a few applications we are currently undertaking. Uh, first one is free ranking. So it actually will be rolled out soon. Uh, 
you will fi figure out, you will find your like uh, your career health field uh, career health feed will be more relevant to your interest and your engagement. Uh, and also we are gonna use it for notification. We want to push more like relevant job recommendations for you and uh, make, make sure uh, you are stay um, up to date with all the new jobs that we're posting on the website. And also search ranking, because now people are asking valuable questions in, feed, uh, in career feed. We want to make sure we are surfacing those uh, feed for you as well. And last but not least, again, job recommendations for uh, more relevant jobs. Um, so next, I'm going to pass to Gip to talk about our AI competition. Hey, um, could I just interrupt real quick? With, thank you so much, Frank and Emma. That, that those were I love just hearing all these applications. Just just a quick like I love both their opinions on this. Um, Frank, you mentioned using GPT four a lot from OpenAI. Do, what, what do you think? I'd love to hear both of you like Bard compared to GPT four. Oh man! <laughs> All right, so uh, you know, I I think GPT four personally, from what I I've been using, I've been experimenting with um, sort of three three maybe four. So Bard, um, Chat GPT, um, Jasper, um, and Bing, um, which uses uh, GPT. And between those, to me, um, the results I get on GPT four are miles better than what I've been seeing from Bard. Um, I think. You know, Google has the advantage of being able to sort of take more recent data and incorporate it into the responses. So if there's things that need a like a very current response, like I was just trying to look up a particular paper that was in Nature and have it summarize that for me, like a Nature paper that just came out a month ago. I'm like, oh, OK, you know, Bard might be good for that. But with the plugins that, that are now in uh, you know chat GPT, the plugins are super powerful. So if you um, use the uh, the paid version, which gives you access to GPT-4, I would highly, highly recommend that you apply to get access to the plugins because the plugins now allow you to do things like read longer papers, summarize those, you know, and, and they also incorporate Bing search into, into GPT-4. So for me, like GPT-4 is like, like a game changer. And in fact, I, I hesitate using other tools unless I know what's under the hood, because I'm like, if it's not chat GPT-4, like maybe it's anthropic, maybe it's something, I mean, who knows what it is, right? And, and I might get a totally different result. These models I find are, um, you know, it, it, what I found over time, at least with the AI, is like every time you rev the model, like it gives you different outputs. So you have to be just very careful knowing what model you're working off of. That, that's my opinion. Fascinating. Emma, how about you? I'd love your take. Yeah, so I think personally, I use GPT-4 more. Mostly because I can, uh, I'm more kind of comfortable with the API call to use the GPT-4 because there are parameters that you can tune to your specific applications. I think Bar is really good at like generating more human-like responses compared to GPT-4, based on my experience. But I think like GPT-4 in general, the um, the design and also the use case is more kind of like engineering friendly compared to uh, Bar. Awesome. Yeah, I, I use them both as well. And um, they're wildly different. That's all I can yeah. say. And, and um, both confidently <laughs> often. <laughs> okay. Well, got check it up. Okay, Gabe, oh, oh, thank you, Emma and Frank, so much. I, I loved hearing you guys. Uh, Gabe, over to you. Hey, uh, Gabe Lunastaseski here, uh, co founder, CRO, uh, Brain Trust. Uh, I will lead off some of the competition that we ran. Uh, so really exciting to see folks leaning into this, uh, both like experienced people that have been doing this for now months uh, and, and people that are brand new to it, just kind of uh, turn, turning over the page. So exciting to see everyone uh, leaning into this and, uh, and learning about how you can use these tools. Uh, so we can go to the next slide here. Cool. So uh, what we decided was actually to split um, Split the competition to be able to give some awards on Brain Trust core team, and, and then also Brain Trust community. Um, obviously, there there's there are some differences in context depending on how like how many hours every single day you're working within Brain Trust uh, as your kind of core responsibility versus you know versus leaning in as a as a community or team member. So uh, we we split the competition. There'll be prizes uh, for both sides, but we thought it'd be valuable uh, to to share the love. So uh, in third place uh, on core team was Rana. Uh, Rana had come up with a uh, proposed a project to basically double the screening capacity of the screening team using exactly the same team. 
Um, so being able to do a lot of the the transcription and and summarizing and bullets that come out of the the screening interviews uh, takes a lot of time, and being able to automate all of that would would actually save fifty percent um, for those folks or give them you know twice give them fifty percent more capacity. Uh, so congratulations, Rana! Uh, you get at a hundred B trust, and uh, and great to see your creativity coming alive here. Uh, in second place, Emma um, came up with a great project to run streamlining job descriptions for both client and talent. So what, why is this important? Uh, you know, creating job descriptions for clients is, is actually a very uh, labor intensive process that takes a lot of back and forth with salespeople, slows down the process, and, and frankly, like is a pretty unsatisfying experience for clients. Um, and on the on the talent side, you know, being able to actually apply for a job, create, uh, you know, you know uh, customized content for a client. Again, there's a lot of friction in that process uh, that takes both time and energy. And if, if our job is really to help make great earning opportunities um, and hiring opportunities between the two, you know, this could potentially save both client and talents a ton of money um, and, and, and thus time for the talents. So uh, we thought it would be really interesting for, for talent and for clients. So there's kind of a double word score there. Uh, Emma, uh, congratulations, 200 B trust for you. Um, and in first place, uh, Slater, uh, who's a, a senior manager of operations, came up with a really interesting idea about how you could potentially drive more GSV, more dollars into the network for the talent community. And essentially automating, um, scouring the web for open freelance roles that are posted on other job boards, identifying essentially net new clients, and then actually matching them with open roles, um, and automating the outreach to those to those uh, to those potential customers. And you know, if this you know if, if this works, this could essentially just put more dollars into our into our talent community's hands, and that's like why we're all here. And so uh, congratulations Slater, uh, 500 B trust, um, and thank you for the submission. Cool, uh, so now moving on um, into the community. Uh, Victor um, in third place for uh, and winning 100 B trust, focusing on uh, engaging and retaining users. Um, so essentially building a, a predictive analytics solution to be able to uh, essentially look at which talent is engaging, bidding, like uh, posting to jobs, active in the network, and then providing a really personalized set of notifications, recommendations, and, and actions to essentially personalize that scale and, and help um, you know, provide great talent uh, and opportunity to keep showing up in the network every day and uh, earning, learning, and growing. So congratulations, Victor. Uh, in second place, uh, Gregor. Um, so we looked a little bit about like the onboarding process, like essentially the zero to one challenge. Like when you're a new talent that's just joining the team or just joining the network, building your profile, essentially like uh, you know starting to to work on jobs. What what his project was focused on is is essentially reducing friction dramatically and reducing the time involved in building your profile. In, in essentially applying to jobs and, and getting hired. Um, so uh, Gregor, thanks for the submission, uh, 200 B trust for you, uh, congratulations. And then first, uh, Mohammed, um, really uh, again, looking at this kind of cold start problem or recommendation engine for, for somebody that's starting the, joining the network for the first time, and that doesn't necessarily know, you know, how to, you know, build a, how to build their profile, how to get hired, um, and also like how to start earning uh, within the network. So being able to uh, again essentially use these tools to personalize and reduce friction uh, for for the uh, talent community. So uh, thanks so much, Mohammed. Uh, congratulations, uh, 500 B trust for you. So I, I just want to thank everyone for taking time to submit. Uh, we're we're going to be doing a lot more of this as the time goes on. I think this is, these are some incredible tools to you know in, in all of your tool belts as freelancers, as as core key contributors, um, both to improve your own lives, but also to think about how you can use these tools to design better experiences for our clients, for our talent community, and, and everyone in between. So. 
uh, you'll be seeing a lot more of this from us. Um, and, and just want to thank everyone for putting time and energy. It feels like, uh, you know, it, it feels like we're experiencing a big shift in the way in which work gets done and we're excited to be leading the charge. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, so um, yeah, thank you all for joining and thank you for all the submission. Once again, congratulations to the winners and I will be in contact with the winners right after this webinar. And don't forget that we'll find this, um, this webinar on our YouTube channel later this week. And uh, feel free to, uh, I see some questions uh, in our chat, feel free to take them over to the professional network or start your own, your, your new topic. Uh, but yeah, we will see you next time.